Welcome back. This is Mr. Wakefield looking at section 6.7 right here in the middle of the uh, uh, chapter 6 uh, and most of chapter 7 packet here that we uh, have a packet for. Uh, and in uh, these next four problems right here, we're going to see something that we saw earlier in the semester. It's just that now we're going to throw some bigger fractions at you now, uh, kind of similar to the last section in 6.6. .6. We're going to kind of combine what we learned there a little bit with what we learned back in Chapter 1. Let me just review that with you real quick. When we saw the formula for a specified variable back then, uh, what happened was, is, and we'll do the same thing here today, is we'll look at uh, the equations and treat the uh, uh, all the letters that you see in the problem as constants with the exception of the uh, variable that they designated. So if you're solving for W, we treat the A and the L like they're constants. All right? And if you do that, uh, then in this section before, when we did that, uh, it would ended up being a linear equation. All right, where, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, linear equations are when you have a polynomial on both sides after you clear out the parentheses, as we saw in the very first section of the semester. Polynomial on both sides after you clear out the parentheses and the variable, the designated variable, is just to the first power. It's just x, not x to the second or x to the third. That same thing happened here in this section where the variable uh, was always to the first power and you had, parent you, excuse me, you had uh, uh, polynomials on both sides after any parentheses were cleared out. So that same thing is going to happen here today. Uh, the only difference is that you have to clear out the fraction first. Then it will be an equation that uh, fits that linear type of format once again. And you just have to follow those same steps that you do uh, for solving a linear equation after you get rid of that uh, fraction. All right. Now, in the last section, we learned how to get rid of that fraction. It's to multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD. But at least in three out of these four problems, not number one right here, but the other three problems here, I have a little shortcut for you that we were not able to use in the last section, but we can use it here. Please notice that uh, when you have just a regular term on one side, you can make that into a fraction right there. And the reason why that I do that, S over 1, is because if you have just a single fraction on each side of an equation, all right, and you want to solve that equation, it's just a single fraction, nothing else, not even a negative sign sitting outside of each fraction. Just a single fraction on each side of the equal sign. When that happens, you can do this thing called cross-multiplying. Not cross-canceling, but cross-multiplying. All right, if I do that, I get this right here. S times, and put this in brackets, if any one of your numerators or denominators has more than one term in it, you got to bracket it because you're multiplying it by the opposite uh thing there that's going across um, and then one times a is a so after you get rid of the fraction like I just did right there you now uh, just follow the linear steps okay that means to distribute first and we get s minus sr over a okay and then uh, assuming you've just uh, normally at this point you combine like terms but there are no like terms to combine we learn though that after you do those first two steps in the linear equation, you then take the terms that do, that have the variable in it, and I, I highlighted them there in red, and then you take the terms that do not have the variable in it, highlighted in green right there, and you put them on opposite sides. So you put the uh, red ones on one side, and the green ones on the other. Doesn't matter which side is which, as long as the reds are on one side and the greens are on the other. Please notice that this one is red because it's got the designated variable in it up here. Okay, but the other two terms are green because they do not have the designated variable in it. Okay, remember we're pretending basically that all the other letters besides R are going to be constants. And so these things do not have the actual variable in it. And even though it looks like they have variables, they have letters, and we think of letters as variables usually, but not in this case. In this case, only R is the variable. So anything that doesn't have R in it, that's the green term. So as you guys know, when you get to the step of a linear equation, you're supposed to once again move the 
green ones to one side and it's the opposite side of wherever the R or wherever the uh, red term is. So we end up with this right here. Okay, and then at that point you then what? You then divide out after you get the red term by itself, you divide out in order to get the variable completely by itself and we end up with R equal to A minus S over negative S. No, you cannot cancel the S's right there because this has got two terms and so this is a prime red factor there and this is a single term factor and so it's green. All right, so red and green you can never ca cancel with red and green. All right, uh, not allowed to combine red and green when you cancel. So that's why I'm going to leave the answer just like that. Okay, let's try that again. Once again, we have a f uh, fraction in our equation, but once again, I can make the Z into a fraction and then cross multiply. All right, why am I allowed to cross multiply again compared to the equation uh, that I, the equations that I had in the last section? What's different about these equations uh, in problems A and B right here versus the equations that we saw uh, in uh, section 6.6, .6. all right? Um, the difference is that uh, we do not have just a single fraction on both sides, all right? You don't have that here. And so, but when you do, you can cross multiply. And we get this right here, don't we? One times uh, a numerator. Uh, normally you'd have to bracket this, but because you're multiplying by positive one, as we've talked about before, uh, the brackets aren't needed when uh, you've got more than one term, but it's being multiplied by positive one. All right. So what do we got here? We have no parentheses like we did in the last problem, so you don't have to do that step. There's no like terms to combine. So then we get to that step where we have to move the variable terms to one side and the constant terms to the other side. In other words, the terms that don't have the variable in it to the other side. And so therefore we have a red one in the middle there and a couple of green ones. Please understand you guys, the X with the bar over it, that is a completely separate variable because of the bar compared to just regular X. All right, I want to clear that up. And then what you do on this step, as usual, when you're on this step, the way you move the reds and greens to other sides is to add or subtract them over. So I'm going to add that X bar over there. Uh, and you'll see there that if I do that, uh, not only will I have the X term by itself, but the X will be by itself already. You don't have to divide out like you normally do. And we did it. Okay. All right, now, I'm going to get you started on this next problem here. I wanted to point out something here uh, that we learned uh, back in Chapter 1. Uh, first of all, in order to solve for a variable, not only do you need to isolate it, Sorry, that came off the screen there. There we go. Not only do you need to isolate a variable when you solve for it, but it cannot be on the other side. All right, I'm concerned about that for this next problem here. All right, uh, this next problem here is similar to uh, this problem that we saw back in Chapter 1 where the W is the variable. And we have two terms with W in it. Okay, I see a lot of students that what they'll do is they'll move one of these terms over here that has a W in it, and then they'll divide out to get this W by itself, for example. The problem with that is that you can't have W on the other side if you have W by itself. The, the variable is not truly solved for, it's not truly solved for if uh, the variable, the same variable, is on the other side. Okay, um, so what you got to do in this case is you got to do that thing that we learned before when you have two terms with a variable in it, uh, once you get them on one side and you get all the other terms over on the other side, then you do this thing where you factor out the variable and then divide out. We'll do that again here. Um, you know what, actually now that I've explained that, um, Go ahead and try that, all right? Uh, certainly, I'll show you the answer here after you hit play again. So uh, let's give it a shot, all right? And then uh, I'll show you that answer when you hit play. 
All right, now in number one there, again, you can see there that unlike the other problems, uh, you do need to actually go through that process we did in the last section where you multiply by the LCD um, because uh, you don't have a single fraction on each side, so you can't cross multiply. Be really nice if you could because it's a lot easier that way to be able to cross multiply. Uh, the LCD is PQF all to the first power there, P, Q, and F, because all three of those variables are in your denominators. All three of these, <clears throat> excuse me, all three of these denominators are single terms, so you use the single term method for solving or for figuring out the LCD, and that means to take the largest exponent of each different variable. Well, the largest uh, exponent of each different variable is to the first power, okay? Uh, and so that's why they all go in there like that. Uh, so now we need to multiply all three of these fractions, just like we did in section 6.6, .6, uh, bringing down the plus in between these two fractions just in exactly the same way we did there. All right. Uh, and when we do that, because everything's a single term here, you can just start canceling without factoring first. Uh, P's cancel on the first one. Q's cancel on the second. The F's cancel on the third. And that leads to what? That leads to what you see right here, QF plus PF equal to PQ. Once again, though, you guys, um, once you clear out the fractions, you do your linear steps because this is going to be a linear type of equation, all right, where you have just Q to the first power. Um, there's no parentheses. There's no like terms to combine. But we do have a couple of Q terms because Q is the designated variable here. And then we have a, a green term because Q, the Q is not in that. So what do we got to do? We got to move the red ones to the same side, don't we? And uh, not only that, but you got to move it to the opposite side of wherever the green one is. That's the reason why you have to subtract uh, the QF over to the other side. If I subtract the QF over, I get PF by itself and then PQ minus QF over there. All right, but as we saw in that uh, problem I just showed you from chapter one, when you get, uh, when you have two terms with the variable in it, and they're now both on the same side and the other terms are now moved over to the other side, you then, you don't divide yet, you have to factor out the Q. If I factor out the Q, it looks like this right here, Q bracket P minus F. All right, so now that I've done that, you then take that, just like that problem I showed you a minute ago, you then divide by that bracket you just created, P minus F, all right? So divide both sides by P minus F. That will get the Q by itself, and so the final answer will be, again, PF over P minus F. Do not cancel the P's or the F's because, again, all right, this is a red factor down here. Remember, you got to identify your factors when you're canceling, right? Uh, you got a red factor and a green factor, all right, and the uh, one down there on the bottom, since it's red, cannot cancel with something that's green. All right, so PF over P minus F, final answer. Uh, number two, though, we go back to uh, uh, looking like uh, these two problems up here where you can cross multiply because you can take the I and make it into a fraction, I over one, all right, uh, cross multiply, and we get this right here. Uh, yeah, I actually did it the long way here. I don't know why I did that. Uh, I didn't cross multiply, but it has the same effect. Okay. Uh, in fact, you know what? Let me erase that just to be consistent with, I multiply both sides by the LCD, which is perfectly fine. It's just that it's more work that way. So why do that? But for some reason, when I originally wrote that down, I did that. Uh, so here's what it would look like if I cross multiply. All right. Uh, just a little bit less work there, but the same result. Um, so I times R plus little r. Uh, and then E times 1 is E. I then, once I clear out the uh, fractions, I then realize that this is a linear equation because uh, the little r that we're, that's the variable right here is just to the first power. There's no r to the second or r to the third. Uh, and then, um, so I clear out the parentheses. That's the first step of a linear equation. 
No like terms to combine, but I need to get the reds and the greens on the opposite side. So that means that I need to subtract the IR over. Please understand that the big R and the little r are two different variables. Okay, uppercase and lowercase are meant to be two separate things. So I got to subtract over the I, uh, the I times the big R. Um, you get this right here. I then need to divide by big I or divide by I right there to get the little r by itself. And you can see that that's the result that we get then. Again, do not cancel the I's because this is a green one down here and this is a red one up here. Okay, cannot cancel green and red. All right, also cannot cancel part of a red one and leave the rest of the red one there. That's another reason why you can't cancel. Okay, so that concludes uh, the first part here of section 6.7. All right, we're going to see some word problems uh, coming up here uh, in this next part here, but uh, wanted to make sure that we understood these problems here first. All right, so in regards to these word problems down here in the second part of section 6.7, we have uh, this first formula is what we're mainly going to be focusing on here. Uh, and... Uh, it says this is equal to rate times time. The rate, by the way, is the average speed of an object that travels over a certain distance, which goes here, over a certain period of time, which goes here. And this is multiplication right here. Okay, and so I just want to make sure you knew that wasn't a variable. Uh, and so, uh, for example, if I'm uh, going on a trip that is 200 miles long, um, and it took me four hours to get there, uh, what would have to be my average speed? Well, since uh, 50 times four is equal to 200, uh, my average speed would then have to be 50 miles per hour in order to uh, get to that 200 mile distance in four hours. All right, and so that's how the formula works. Uh, what we're gonna particularly be using, and I'll explain why here coming up, uh, is this particular formula here. This is just the same thing, just written in a different way. If you took D equal to R times T, distance is equal to rate times time, and you divide both sides of the equation by R, which of course we can do, all right, um, we get what here? We get T is equal to, as this, as this says right here, T is equal to D divided by R, all right? And so that's what we're going to use. Uh, now, when we were back in section uh, 3.2, all the way back in uh, the first packet, near the end of the first packet, um, let me just pull that up here for you real quick. Uh, we had these box problems right here. We're going to see something similar to that here where we got the three parts to the formula on the top. We have uh, three parts now here as well, T, D, and R. Um, but the difference is that we're not going to have this third row right here. We won't need that. All right. We won't have a together row. Uh, again, not needed. Uh, but uh, we are going to have the three parts of the formula. So I'll show you uh, how that's all going to work here coming up. Let's try that. Let's take a look at the first problem here. Um, it says a passenger train can travel 240 miles in the same amount of time it takes a freight train to travel 160 miles. If the rate of the freight train is 20 miles per hour slower than the rate of the passenger train, what's the average rate? In other words, the average speed of each. Uh, so how many things are we looking for here? Sometimes in the past we've had word problems where you had to find two things. Sometimes we have word problems where you had to find one thing. Here it says the average rate of each. What do they mean by each? Well, they're talking about two different types of trains here, aren't they? Passenger train and freight train. So we must be looking for two different things here. The average rate of the uh, passenger train, okay? And also we're looking for the average rate of the uh, freight train. Okay.
And so since we're looking for two different things, we need to do X and Y, just like we did back in section 3.2 when we had to find two different things, and so we had X and Y. Same thing, all right? Uh, now, uh, because we have two variables, we need to come up with two equations, just like we did in chapter 3. Uh, the way in which we find those is a little different, but the whole box setup with only two rows this time, uh, otherwise very similar to before, that is really going to help us find what we need here. All right, now... Um, Here's how it's going to work. Across the top here, I need you to write it in this order, you guys. you got to go distance divided by rate is equal to time. The same formula I talked about on the front of the worksheet, okay? Uh, but you got to write it in that order right there, okay? Very good reason for that that you'll see coming up here. Now, um, what do the two rows represent? Well, they, two, they represent the two objects that are in motion, all right, so if you got a problem where two different objects are in motion and they talk about, um, as they do in this problem, they talk about speed and time and distance, that usually means that this is the type of setup that you want to do. All right, two objects in motion with distance, rate, and time being discussed. All right, that's a clue to you that, hey, I need to set it up like this with the formula like this on the top with the two objects in motion here. And so let's start filling these things in. We'll fill them in the same way we did before with the box problems where you start out with the first row and you work your way over. All right. Uh, the, what are the distances that these objects travel? Well, it tells us here that the passenger train went 240 and the freight train went 160. So we put those in there. Okay. Uh, it also tells us... Uh, that, that uh, well that doesn't tell us what the rates are but remember as we did in the past with those box problems before if you know what a box is equal to you know the constant number that it's equal to such as 240 or 160 put that in there put that in the box if you don't know what a box is equal to but you have a variable designated for it then you put the variable in there instead all right now um as we go across here, they don't tell us anything in this problem about the time. They don't tell us how long it takes for each individual uh, train, but it does tell us something important though. It says the times are going to be the same. It says the same amount of time for both trains. All right, uh, They both get to their individual destination in the same amount of time. That means that these two boxes are going to be equal to each other. Okay equal to each other, but we need to know what they're equal to first so that we can then make an equation out of it with an equal sign. Remember, we want to make equations. In fact, we want to make two equations since we have two variables, all right? Uh, and equations mean equal, right? So that's good that these are equal. We just got to figure out what this is. Well, since we don't know what the boxes are equal to, and since we already used up our variables on something else, all right, and don't and they come up with more variables. That's going to mess things up. Don't do any more variables than what you already designated at the beginning. All right. Um, the only choice we have is to use the formula to go across, just like we did before in the box problems before. If you have no other way of filling in that box, either by a constant number that they tell you or a variable that you designated, then you have to use the formula to go across. And since this is division, I'm going to say 240 divided by X. I'm going to say 160 divided by Y. All right. Um, and so that can give me a brand new equation here. All right. 240 divided by X is equal to 160 divided by Y. And I know that they're equal because we just found out that the times are equal. And so the two time boxes, all right, have to be equal to each other. All right, so great, we found an equation. All right, now the problem though is that we need, we need two equations though, because we have two variables. All right, so um, sometimes the boxes, you guys, don't tell you all the equations. The box problems we did before did, but the, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have to go back into the problem and read it a little more closely in order to find your other equation. And we can do that right now.
Notice here it says the rate of the freight train is, is, is means equal usually in math, doesn't it? Okay, equal. All right, um, and so we can make an equation out of that hopefully. Let's see what happens. The rate of the freight train, that's y, isn't it? Let's write that down. Rate of the freight train is y, so the y goes right here. And then the equal sign goes right there, so I brought the equal sign down. And then it says 20 slower than the rate of the passenger train. Let's talk about that for a second. We've got to be really careful there. First of all, slower than means less than. Okay. However, the phrase less than, if you don't remember this from a previous math class, let me tell you now, with the phrase less than, yes, that means subtraction, but it's more than that, okay? And not only does it mean subtraction, but the numbers that you're talking about in the sentence need to be reversed, okay? So if it says 20 less than X, which is what the rate of the passenger train is right here, so let me say it again, 20 less than X, 20 less than X means you have to reverse the 20 in the x and you say x minus 20. You don't always reverse it when it's subtraction, but you do one of the times that you do reverse it is when the phrase less than is used. Okay? They they don't always use the phrase less than when they're talking about subtraction though. But when they do, you gotta reverse it like that. And so as you can see here, we now have two equations, you guys that both have our two variables in it. And that's what you need when you have a word problem with two variables. Two equations with your two variables in it. All right, now, now that we have that, and we kind of saw something similar to this at chapter five, uh, where uh, you have one equation that's a linear equation, and then one equation that's not a linear equation. And I know that this is not linear because, as we learned in the, la uh, in the last section, if you have a fraction equation with variables on the bottom, that can't be linear. Okay? It's not even a polynomial equation to begin with. So if you've got a linear equation and a nonlinear equation, it's usually easiest when you, do, when you solve the system, which is what we've got to do now, like we always do when we have our two equations in our word problem. You plug the linear one into the nonlinear one. Let me do that. Okay. And we get what? We get 240 over x is equal to 160 over x minus 20. All right. Um, and then we solve that resulting equation, just like we always do in the substitution method. And so I now what? I now need to... Uh, solve that and again notice like we saw in the previous part of this uh, current section when you have a single fraction on each side you can solve the equation by cross multiplying like this just like we did a few minutes ago here in the early part of this current section like this so then I solve that resulting equation Okay, um, it's a linear equation, so I just go through the normal steps here. I need to move the 240x over to the other side by subtracting that over. If I do subtract it over, it's going to be um, negative 80x. Divide out to get the x by itself, and you get x is equal to 60. x is equal to 60, but remember, we still got to solve for the other variable okay and so we get y is equal to 60 minus 20 remember you could plug it into any equation that has both variables in it in order to uh, solve the other variable there uh, and so we get y equal to 40 okay so we figured out what our two variables are equal to as we've always done in the past, when we have uh, a uh, problem, a word problem where you have two variables and two things you're trying to figure out, not only do I need you to tell me how these two numbers are measured, but also which one is which. Okay, so first of all, since 60 and 40 are the rates, in other words, they're the speeds, you have to tell me how uh, they're measured in, in speed, okay? Remember, you guys, whenever they talk about speed, it has always uh, got that word per in it, okay? Just like when you go down uh, the road and you see that sign that says 25 MPH, that means miles per hour, 
right? And so the word per is always in the speed. So you can see here that when they say miles per hour right here, up here, that's telling you that that's how they measure the speed in this particular problem, all right? And so that's why um, I'm gonna write down 60 MPH and 40 MPH, all right? And you can say miles per hour if you want, but you could also say MPH for short. Uh, that's fine. And so we have um, MPH for both of those. But I know that that's how it's measured because I know that I'm trying to find rate or speed. And speed is always measured with the word per. All right. But you got to have the whole thing there. The distance component, which is miles. Miles is the way they measure distance here, how far they traveled. And then hours is how they measure time. You got to have all three of those words the distance component the time component with the word per in between. I just want to make sure you know exactly how to write that. Now, one thing I forgot to mention there, I didn't mean to circle that yet, but I can I can just point to it here. Uh, which one is which? we got to say that as well. Um, the 60 miles per hour was which one? That was the X, and the X was the passenger train. So just tell me which one is which there. All right. Um, Remember, it says the average rate of each. So if somebody says, hey, what's the average rate of each? You're not just going to say 60 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour. You're going to tell that person which one is the passenger train and which one is the freight train, to be completely precise. So you got to say that uh, last part there. Okay. Okay, so now the second problem here is very similar. Um, the traffic is so heavy this morning and you can walk 10 miles in the same time. There's that, there's that phrase again, in the same time. So that means that we're going to be able to take the two time boxes and make them equal to find an equation. In the same time that it'll take to travel 15 miles by car. If the car's rate is 3 miles per hour faster than. Now faster than, by the way, means more than. So it's actually going to be plus this time instead of subtraction. But we'll get into that. Other than that, it's a very similar problem. Faster than your walking rate, find the average rate of each. Okay, so again, we are trying to find the average rate of two different things here. All right, just like in the last problem, average rate of each. What are the two things this time? Uh, it is uh, the average rate of walking and the average rate of what? Of the car, right? Okay. Um, because they're talking about the walking rate and then the car's rate, aren't they? So I'll say that X is the walking rate, the speed of the walking, and Y is the speed of the car. All right. So, again, we're going to do the same type of setup. The walking, is, remember, there's two objects in motion here. In this case, it's the person walking and uh, the car itself. All right, two different situations, walking and driving. So walking car here uh, and then we're going to use the same formula by the way why did I insist on using the formula so that the T was over here it's because when you figure out these two time boxes all right uh, and the only way to figure them out usually in these problems anyway is by going across dividing across because they don't tell us anything about the time boxes like I said in the last problem okay this problem is gonna be the same they don't tell us anything about these time boxes other than the fact that they are uh, gonna be equal to each other so putting in this order will allow us to divide across to fill those in Anyway, let's get started here. What goes into that first column there? It tells us that they walk 10 miles, so that means that it's dis their distance is 10 miles uh, for the walking part. Uh, it tells us that the car goes 15 miles, so its distance is 15. Uh, again, they don't tell us what the speeds are, but they do give us the, the variables for that, right? Okay. By the way, you guys, please do not forget to do this first. All right? Always say what you're trying to find first. Designate your variables. Otherwise, you'll be completely thrown off. You won't know, won't know what your variables are, and therefore you won't know where they go and all that. Do this first before anything else over here. All right. And so now, going to this last column, there's no way to fill those in uh, other than to use the formula to go across and so I go across here and since it means division right here instead of multiplication like it did back in 3.2 uh, we divide across and we get that 
since the times are supposed to be equal to each other, that's why I'm writing down that these two boxes right here are equal to each other, the two time boxes, all right, and there's equation number one. But because we have two variables, you need another equation, don't you? All right, so what is that other equation? That other equation is the fact that uh, uh, the car's rate is, and so there's your equal sign, the car's rate is, so the car's rate is y over here, isn't it? Okay. And so is means equal. Bring down the equal sign right there. And then it says three faster than your walking rate. Faster than means more than. More than means plus. And so we're going to say three plus the walking rate, which is x. And so let me say that again. Three plus x right here okay so 3 plus x and there's your other equation all right now uh, just like the last problem you have a linear equation and a nonlinear equation all right we got two equations with both of our variables in it so we can solve this doing uh, the substitution method uh, again we can plug in the 3 plus x into the y up here Plugging the linear equation into the nonlinear equation. All right, that's usually the best way to do it. And then that leads to, once again, an equation where you have uh, just a single fraction on each side. That means we can cross multiply like this. All right. And uh, that means what then? That means that I now need to distribute. Okay, in order. I'm, try to solve that equation now after I cross multiply it's just a normal linear equation after you cross multiply that's what it looks like uh, so I get uh, what here I need to move over the 10 X over with the 15 X and then divide out by the 5 and if I divide by the 5 I get X equal to 6 all right but I still need to solve for the the other variable there, the y, since I just solved for x, I now solve for the y, and so now the y is, as you can see here, is equal to 9. So we've got the two variables, you guys. We have the two variables, all right, and um, we now need to do what when we have two variables? Or, in, yeah, when we have two variables on a word problem, we say how they're measured, and then we say which one is which, okay? So, um, the 6 and 9, how are they measured right here? Just like the last problem, uh, the speed, since it has the word per in it always, we know that looking in the problem, we can see that miles per hour is how they measure speed. All right, and so once again, MPH is how they measure the speeds or the rates in these in this particular problem. Uh, which one is which? Which one is the walking, in other words, and which one is the car? Okay, uh, the six miles per hour is the one that is the the walking rate. All right, in other words, tell me which one is the, it, it, as they say here, all right, uh, we know that one of them is the walking and one of them is the car, so you just gotta tell me uh, which one is which, like we said in the last problem. So. Which one is uh, the X here? That's the 6. So the, the 6 must be the walking rate, right? Okay, and then the car is the, the 9 miles per hour. Don't have to have an overly detailed description there. Just tell me which one is the 6 and which one's the 9 so I can tell the difference. Okay? All right, moving on to this next problem here. Um, it talks about a boat that's going downstream, as you can see here, and then it talks about upstream as well. We're going to talk about, in each of these next three problems, objects that move uh, either downstream or upstream, okay, in a river, for example, and that's what they're talking about here. And what happens with that is that uh, when you're in a river, if you're going downstream, that means you're going with the current. The current meaning that uh, the, uh, the waves that you see going down a river, all right, and those waves, just like the waves 
waves in the ocean. If you're going in the same direction as the wave, what does it do? It speeds you up a little bit. But if you try to uh, go against the wave, it's going to slow you down a little bit. All right. So when you're going with the current, uh, it is uh, it makes you feel like you're going downhill. It makes you go faster. And so that's why they call it downstream. It doesn't mean that the river is actually going uh, downhill. Uh, it just feels like it. So we have downstream when you're going in the same direction as the current, the little waves, okay? And then upstream when you then go against that current and your boat's going uh, actually towards the waves instead of with them, all right, against the waves. Uh, so based on, let, let me go and read the whole uh, thing. It says in still water, okay? Now still water is when you're like in a lake, okay? In other words, your boat normally, if it's in a nice still lake with no waves at all, it normally goes eight miles per hour. But if you then throw that uh, boat into a river with the current, here's what happens. It goes 30 miles downstream with the current uh, in the same amount of time. There's that phrase again, in the same amount of time. So we're going to get that thing again where the two boxes are equal, the two time boxes are equal, but it's the same amount of time to go 30 miles downstream as it is 18 miles upstream. Based on that, it asks just one question this time. What is the rate of the actual current itself? In other words, what's the rate of those little waves going down the river? How fast are those waves moving? Okay, we're going to call that uh, X right here. You can call it any letter you want. We just need it to be a variable. And so now, because we only have one uh, variable, we only need one equation, don't we? All right, we've seen that in password problems as well. One variable, one equation is all you need. So again, we're going to use the same formula because mainly because we should have that same amount of time phrase in this problem again. All right, and so uh, using the that same formula will allow us to uh, figure out what these two boxes are equal to and then set them equal to each other because the time boxes have to be the same. All right. And so uh, the two objects that are in motion this time, there's only one object in reality in motion, and that's the boat, but it's in motion in two different scenarios. All right. In one case, it's going what? It's going downstream. And then we need a separate row for the upstream because it's different numbers for upstream, isn't it? Okay, the distance is different. The speed is going to be different, as we'll see here. And it, that makes logical sense that your speed would be different when you're going upstream compared to downstream because it's going to slow you down when you're going upstream. Um, so let's start filling this in just like we normally do. It says uh, that the distance for downstream is 30, doesn't it? Tell us, it tells us that right there. The distance for upstream is 18. Tells us that right here, 18 miles upstream. Okay, now here's the part where we need to be careful. All right, I have a new uh, set, a new formula here for you. Okay, do not put eight in here alone. The eight here, I know that that's speed because it says uh, the word per right there. Per means that they're talking about speed. But uh, this is the still water speed, you guys. These two boxes, however, are what? They are the downstream speed and the upstream speed. That's different than the still water speed because we know that the downstream speeds us up from the normal still water situation and the upstream slows us down. So it can't be eight. It's a little bit different than that. We have a for couple pairs of formulas here I want to show you. All right. Um, I wrote them down up here at the top. Downstream speed would be still water speed with the speed of the current added to that and we add because it is going to be um it's going to speed up so you, it makes sense that uh, uh you would have to add uh the upstream speed because it slows you down we're going to have the same two things here this uh speed and still water and the speed of the current but the difference is that we're going to subtract because it's going to slow you down it's going to make it less Okay, all right, using these two formulas, knowing that in the current problem that we're in, uh, the still water speed is eight right here. So both of these things will be equal to eight right here. Okay, and then we know that in the current problem, the speed of the current is X. Okay, uh, we designated X to be equal to that. So therefore, the downstream speed, let's uh, put it all together now. The downstream speed, since we have eights right here, and since we have X's right here, 
okay, in both of these. We then have 8 plus x and 8 minus x, okay? Uh, let me go ahead and take that and bring that down here. 8 plus x and 8 minus x. I want to make it clear, you guys, the x is not always going to go second. All right, the current is always going to go second, the speed of the current. Okay, so sometimes your variable will be the still water. If it is, then the variable would go first. The still water always goes first. The current always goes second. A lot of students misunderstand that. Okay, still water always goes first according to the formulas I just showed you there. All right, and the current always goes second. All right, so sometimes the variables will be different places. Just like we did in the previous two problems, all right? We don't know anything about the times other than the fact that they are the same. And so the only thing that I can do for the same reason as before is to divide across. And so I write it as fractions here since fraction means division, okay? And that's your two very that's your two time boxes right there since the times are supposed to be the same though all right that means that we are going to say what we're going to say that 30 over 8 plus x is equal to 18 over 8 minus x the two time boxes are the same all because of this phrase right here that's the reason good news you guys that's the only equation we need. We don't need another one because we only have one variable. So I can start solving this right now. Since I have a single fraction on each side, I can cross multiply. All right. Like that. I then distribute all the same stuff I normally would in a linear equation, which is what this turns out to be like that okay I then need to move the constant terms to one side and the variable terms to the other so if I subtract the 140 uh, yeah if I subtract the 144 over to the left I get 96 if I sub uh, if I add the 30x over to the 8x I get um, and I made a mistake there excuse me this should actually be 18x not 8x 18 times x. I think I was looking at this 8 right here. So yeah, that's 18x. And so if I add 30x over to the 18x, I get 48x. Okay. If I then divide both sides by 48, what do I get? Your calculator will tell you that that does actually divide evenly, and the answer is exactly equal to 2. To what? Well, remember, they asked for the rate again. That means that we need to have per in our answer, right? The word per. So again, and this won't be true on every single problem, but once again, miles per hour is how they measure speed. So our final answer is 2 miles per hour. Okay. All right, so that is the rate of the current. Now, as you'll see here in the next problem, in the next problem, they're going to ask us for uh, what? They're going to ask for the speed of Lynn's boat in what? Still water. So they want the still water speed this time. And so, like I said, the variable is going to be in a little bit of a different place this time. All right. Let's go ahead and read the whole problem. It says a river has a current of four kilometers per hour. Okay. Notice that it's not miles per hour this time. The speed is the, measured this time as kilometers per hour. And so... Uh, Keep an eye out for that as we write out our final answer because they do ask for the speed again as our final answer, just like before. It says, find the speed of Lynn's boat in still water if it goes 40 kilometers downstream in the same amount of time. Again, there's that phrase. We keep on seeing it. Same amount of time that it goes 24 kilometers upstream. All right. So, um, again, what are we looking for? The, this time we're looking for the still water speed, not the speed of the current. In fact, they tell us in this problem what the speed of the current is, don't they? All right, they tell us that the speed of the current is 4 kilometers per hour. It has a current of 4, but because it says kilometers per hour, we know that that's the speed of the current. All right, now...
Same setup here. We use the same formula because we want to be able to have the time box at the end there where, because they don't, again, they don't tell us anything about the times other than the fact that they're the same. So you want to be able to divide across in order to be able to fill in those boxes. There's really no other way to do it. Um, and so we want the time column to be at the end there. Uh, again, when you have a downstream upstream problem, the two rows of your box portion of your problem are going to be downstream and upstream. Downstream and upstream. All right. What are the two distances for downstream and upstream? The problem tells us that it's 40 kilometers for downstream and it's 24 kilometers over here for upstream. And then here's that key part again, all right? We do not put four in here, although that's part of what you put in here. That's the speed of the current. These two boxes are the speed for downstream. That's why it says downstream over here. And then this box is the speed upstream, all right? So we have to, again, go up to the top here. And we know that these two things right here will tell me what the downstream and upstream are equal to. Okay, so what's the still water speed in this problem? The still water speed is X, isn't it? So we put an X here and we put an X here. Then we know that the speed of the current in this problem is four. So we put a four here and we put a four here. What does that give us now? It gives us X plus four and it gives us X minus four, doesn't it? So X plus four, X minus four, that's your two speeds for the downstream and the upstream. Like that. There it is. Dividing across is the only way that we could do this. Okay. There we go. We then um, realize that since the uh, time boxes have to be the same, in other words, they have to be equal, we say this right here. Very similar to the last problem. The big difference in this problem was the location of the variable, okay, being in the front of the of the thing here in the rate boxes, all right? Uh, but now we have just, uh, we just had need one equation because we have only one variable. So we can now solve this. We can cross multiply again for the same reason as before. And then it gives me a linear equation that I certainly know how to solve because I've solved linear equations so many times before in this, in this, uh, we all have in this particular, uh, class. Distribute. There's no like terms to combine. So now I need to move the X's to one side. If I subtract the 24x over with the 40, I get the 16x. If I add the 160 over with the 96, I get 256. I then need to divide out to get the x by itself. And I get x equal to 16. 16 what, you guys? Well, again, this is speed because we they asked for the still water speed. Um, how do they measure speed in this problem? Well, they don't measure it as miles per hour this time. They measure it as kilometers per hour. You can see that right here again. Uh, so you could say KMPH for short if you like, or you could write out the whole thing and say uh, kilometers per hour. Okay. And again, when you only need to find one thing, you don't need to tell me which one's which because there's not two things. It's just one. So just tell me how it's measured when you're just trying to find one thing. Uh, in this case, it's still water speed. And then you'll be done. You can circle that. All right. Please go ahead and try number five now on the back. Number five. Um, and... Uh, it's very similar to problem three and four. And so when you're done doing that, uh, go ahead and hit the play button again and we'll take a look at the answer. All right, again here in number five, just like the previous four problems, they have the phrase same amount of time again. Same amount of time so that we're going to do the same thing where we set the time boxes equal to each other. Uh, again, they tell us what the current is equal to, but they ask for the still water rate, don't they? The still water speed, same thing. And so that's why I have an X over here designated for the still water speed. I then set up my boxes right here. Okay. Uh, six and four are the distances, as the problem tells you. All right. 
Remember the still water always comes first in the in these two boxes right here. Uh, so since the still water is the variable, and that's why the variable is first this time. All right, and then the current speed goes uh, uh, second, and so that's why the two that you see right here at the top uh, that would go in these spots, and then you got plus for downstream and minus for upstream. Do your normal thing here with the time box because the the uh, uh, formula tells you to divide and it gives you this uh, particular uh, equation right here. Okay, so then we solve that equation. As always, since you have a single fraction on each side, you can cross multiply and then solve the resulting equation. All right. Uh, Distribute, combine like terms, or not combine like terms, but move over the uh, move over the x's to one side and the 12 and the 8 over to the other side. It gives you 2x equal to 20. Divide out the 2 and you get x is equal to 10. All right. And why is it 10 miles per hour? It's because the problem tells us that speed is measured in miles per hour. All right. Um, and so that's number five. Again, that's the type of thing that you do when you got one of those downstream upstream problems. All right, now, uh, to finish things off here in this lecture video, um, we are actually going to skip six, seven, and eight. You don't have to do those. Uh, I sometimes do those. I'm not going to do that this time. It's more of the same stuff. The setup is very similar. It's just a different formula that you do. Uh, but uh, it ends up being a similar thing uh, in the end. Um, similar type of thing that you're doing. Uh, well, there's some similarities anyway, but um, but uh, this will be enough here just to do problems one through five. And But what I do want to do is um, show you a couple of your homework problems uh, because they look a little different than what we just talked about, but I want you to realize how similar they are so that it won't throw you off when you read them. Look at number 31, first of all. Number 31 says uh, the rate of the jet stream is 100 miles per hour. So in other words, when an airplane is in the air, it's similar to a boat on a river, which is what we just talked about, right? Okay, an airplane, when it's in the air, sometimes it goes with the jet stream. Okay, it's that jet stream. I'm not a big expert on jet streams, but I know it's similar to like uh, going with the wind or going against the wind. So if you're going with the jet stream, all right, it's like uh, it's like uh, um, running with the wind. Like if you're jogging down the street and you're going in the same direction as the wind, what's the wind going to do? It's going to speed you up just like the current of the river will speed you up if you're going downstream. So in other words, when they say with the jet stream, you guys, that's similar to saying downstream. Okay, similar thing. Uh, and then when they say against the jet stream, that's similar to saying upstream. So just want to make sure that you understand the language there and how similar it is. And then see how it says the uh, average rate in calm air? That's similar to still water. Okay, an airplane in calm air is like a boat in still water. There's no wind or, or current to, you know, to uh, mess with your uh, speed at all. It's just calm or still, all right? So... Downstream here with the jet stream, uh, upstream when it's against the jet stream, and then calm air means um, similar to still water. Number 33 is a similar thing when you're inside of the airport itself. Okay, if you've uh, been to the airport uh, in recent years, uh, or even if you haven't, they've been around for a long time. Uh, a moving sidewalk at an airport is that thing, it's kind of like an escalator, only it's, uh, it doesn't go up or down. It just goes straight across the airport. Uh, you get on it and it'll move so that you don't have to walk if you don't want to. The thing is, though, is that if you do just decide to walk on this moving sidewalk, uh, it'll speed you up. All right. So since the moving sidewalk is moving, it's similar to the current of the river again. All right. So see how it says um, if you move forward, fo going forward on a moving sidewalk will speed you up. So going forward is like downstream. So saying 100 feet forward would be like saying 100 feet downstream in the same time it takes you to go 40 feet in the opposite direction. If you go in the opposite direction on a moving sidewalk, isn't that going to slow you down? Not that anybody would ever do that, okay, but I mean, why would you? But uh, I'm just saying 
that that's what would happen. It would be similar to going upstream where it would slow you down. So this would be like 100 feet downstream and the same amount of time it takes to travel 40 feet upstream. And then it says here, find your walking speed on a non-moving sidewalk. Isn't that similar to still water again? If it's not moving, if the sidewalk, the the uh, moving sidewalk thing suddenly stops working and it's not moving, okay, it's similar to the river uh, suddenly not having a current and being still, okay. Uh, so this is like uh, it's like asking, hey, what's the still water speed right here? Similar to that, and so. Uh, just different words here, you guys, in these two problems, but very similar to the downstream, upstream problems. Okay, so as usual, let me know if you have any concerns or questions. Okay, in regards to this section, you enjoy your day and take care.